something else that you said that I don't, I don't know if you, you even realize you said it, but you talked about a lamb. Can you talk about the significance of the lamb in Christianity? Sure. So again, lamb, uh, lamb of God was one of the titles given to Jesus by John the Baptist. Um, it is an image and a symbol that was carried on through the early church in the New Testament. Um, so two parts to it. Its prior reality also comes from the Jewish tradition. The Jewish connection to God was in many ways a ritual connection. It was very much tied to offering of sacrifices. Because in the act of giving something to God, particularly the first products, the first lamb born out of a uh, uh, an entire flock, or the first harvest, what that meant was you were trusting God to provide the rest that you needed. If you held on to the first part and only gave God the last one, you were taking care of your needs first. So sacrificing a lamb was an act of trust that God would provide, and it was an act of gratitude, saying thank you for this provision. In the same way, lambs were seen as creature that follows a leader, a shepherd, a guide. And so the language of Psalm 23 talks about the Lord is my shepherd. So the language of humans needing a, a heavenly shepherd was part and parcel of both the Jewish and the Christian tradition. But when Jesus goes through his life and then is crucified, is arrested and condemned to die, once more, the language of the sacrifice came to the forefront. And in the Jewish tradition, there were goats and lambs that were treated as symbolic of having the sins of others placed on them. And in, in those animals being sacrificed, it was seen as a way to erase a larger communal sin. In this way, Jesus' death by the early church was seen as a sacrifice that washed away, that removed a larger brokenness and sinfulness. So the language of the lamb and the sacrifice of a lamb carries through a lot of the New Testament scriptures, even to the book of Revelation. Um, the last thing I'll say is early on, they would not ever draw a picture of Jesus. They followed the Old Testament commandments not to make graven images. And so for almost 100 years or more, no one would draw Jesus. But the first symbol that they would use to depict Jesus in the catacombs and in the early Christian tombs was often that of the good shepherd with a lamb either on his shoulders or by his side. So the symbol of Christ as the shepherd was seen as the first um, symbol to communicate who Jesus was uh, as they were telling the early Christian story. What caused the shift between the no images and and? drawing and painting Jesus as a figure. Yeah, it was twofold, I think. One was a desire to truly uh, tell more about who this Jesus was. And so you get, you know, that's why Mark's the first gospel with no Christ, no birth story in it. But then people are saying, well, where did he come from? And so you get Matthew and Luke with the birth stories. In the same way, they said, well, where did he really live? And what was he like? And they used analogies early, but at a certain point, they, they did start to depict Jesus um, in his act of baptism. Uh, so you have early pictures of Jesus in the water with John the Baptist. But I think the real depiction of Jesus uh, started when, uh, with Constantine. And once Christianity became an official language of the Roman Empire, Rome had no problem depicting its people and its gods. And so now you move from this Jesus, the good shepherd and the lamb, to Jesus Pantocrator, the Lord of all heaven and earth, who is depicted in huge murals and mosaics on cathedral ceilings. And that's by the fourth century. And that's actually a really good shift into culture, because um, Christian culture spans globally. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about just Christian culture. If there is even one way to, 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 to talk about it. Well, so Christian culture is actually 
on some levels problematic because by definition what that infers is that a belief in Jesus and practices of worshiping and following Jesus have now been subsumed or influenced by particular expression of human relationships and language and culture. After I graduated from seminary, I spent three years serving a church in Zimbabwe, Africa. That's cool. And so in Africa, there is no difficulty in talking about the power of the Holy Spirit because the idea of a spiritual reality, of an ability to move beyond one region to another region, was fully accepted in a way that uh, post-enlightenment skeptical Americans find difficult. So in that culture, I then had to adapt perhaps a more heady Greek understanding of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to say, all right, if you understand the spirit moving this way and you have a vivid understanding of good and bad spirits, let's talk about how God's nature and being moves to lift up the good and to free us from fear of the evil. A different place. Um, in Korea or in China, where there aren't bread products made from yeast, you have the difficulty of scriptures that talk about Jesus being the bread of life. And so at some level, you have to adapt that either to say Jesus is the, the, the rice, the, there's different uh, Korean and, and Chinese words they can use, but you've now adapted. And so the, the faith has to be flexible enough to still communicate so that the cultural um, vocabulary understands the faith without losing the foundation it's meant to express. So when Christians in a Western place only understand Jesus as in a wafer, an unleavened piece of bread, or a loaf that's torn in a Protestant church, that can be a dividing line between Christians in Korea or in China who understand Jesus as the sustenance of life that is present in a rice bowl or in a different form of starch. Mm -hmm. So when culture sets up definitions of faith that would bar others from participating, then it's a detriment. Mm -hmm. When the culture is humble enough to say, this is how I have learned to express my faith and live out the rituals, let me see how you have lived out an analogous experience and let us find and take joy in each other's expressions. Then culture has a chance to be life-giving and affirming. So in, in churches in, in the East, in, in Asia, when people take communion, if people take communion, are they rice wafers or crackers or, or what? Because <laughs> I, just, I just don't know. Right. So <laughs> sadly... Um, the missionaries that went over to those mm -hmm. countries took with them the practices of their own their own experience. Right. And so take Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. Korea is one nation that the dominant Christian faith is Presbyterian because mm -hmm. Presbyterian missionaries were the ones that arrived there in the 1950s. And then since then it's splintered. There are probably 20 or 30 different Presbyterian denominations in Korea. Um, so, on, so suddenly Christian expression in those settings reflected a 1950s British missionary church experience. So that's why they would sing Fanny Crosby hymns from a, a small bound book in Western notation. And that's why they would probably use typical wafers or unleavened bread from the 1950s. When I was in Zimbabwe, I arrive in this church there, a Presbyterian church, and they're singing from the Church of Scotland hymnary from the 1920s. Interesting. Even though I'm there in the 1980s. But, so the missionaries taught a religion, but gave them the tools of a culture that then had lingered and has stayed, in many cases, the dominant expression, even in those foreign cultures. This is then the, the indigenous churches have moved beyond that, mm -hmm. but they've had, to re, they've had to discover their own voice, even though the first story given to them was someone else's story. Right. So it was a borrowed faith that they then personalized. And I think there's strength and vitality there, but it hasn't happened across the board. And if talking about communion, because I'm sure there's people that don't know what communion is. Can you talk about what that is? So communion is 
a remembrance of a particular action that Jesus did with his followers. Jesus was gathered together for a Jewish festival. It was a Passover festival that had its roots back to the time of Moses, 2,000 years. They would gather annually to remember a time of being in slavery and being moved to a time of freedom. But in this case, Jesus used that vocabulary and that meal, and that meal involved glasses of wine, it involved unleavened bread, it involved spices, and usually some other uh, symbolic food articles. He took that meal and he said, even as we tell this story of moving from slavery to freedom, I'm going to now expand that story. So this bread is not just the bread that was eaten in haste as the Hebrew people were seeking to leave Egypt. This bread is now my body, is my essence that is going to be given for you that it might feed and nurture you. And in the same way, this cup was used as a blessing and as a remembrance and as a, a way to be strengthened for the journey ahead, this cup will be seen as my blood, the fullness, the, the life force of me that I share with you, that you may have the strength for the journey ahead. So communion is a Christian reframing of an earlier Jewish ritual that is still practiced today as a way to enliven and encourage and to welcome around that table the followers of Christ.